Relationships. They're everywhere. And they all come with something. Strings. Laughs. Baggage. Love. Obligations. Rules. Requirements. The only thing they don't come with is an owner's manual, a map, a set of instructions custom made for your unique relationships. So over time, our relationships can fade, fracture, fall apart, and without help, that damage can seem beyond repair. What if there was an owner's manual, a map, a set of instructions custom made for your unique relationships? It's all relative. A Biblical Guide to Relationships. All right, so we're going to start with a question of the week. This is a question that I got in several different forms, but I just kind of put it all into one question. Question, why bother reading Leviticus or tithing for that matter if we are no longer bound to keep the law? So uh, how many have been reading this week and are reading? We're in Leviticus and it's kind of like, Really? Am I supposed to be able to get stuff out of this? I mean, this is not exactly devotional material. Um, it just makes you, you know, really glad when you get to the New Testament part. So that's why it's there. You really appreciate Mark. Now, the reality is our covenant, the new covenant, is both really, I would say, even more than, than the Mosaic covenant flows out of the Abrahamic covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham that was between God and God. So Abraham couldn't mess it up. So that is an everlasting covenant. Then God made a covenant with Moses, right? Now, that was a conditional covenant, and they did mess it up, but that was what set up the coming of Messiah. So the role of the Jewish people, they were called by God to, to bring about Messiah. Now, once Jesus came, the Old Testament promised that there would be a new covenant. And once again, uh, an unbreakable covenant, and it's between now the Father and the Son. And if we're in Jesus, we get to appreciate that. Now, does that really relate directly? Does Leviticus r relate directly to that? No, it's a whole bunch of laws and rules and regulations and how to do this and how to do that. And yes, it's a little thick. But if you've never read it before, you need to read it at least once. You need to at least know what's a part of your history. And if nothing else, it will help you appreciate what you have in Jesus. Now, with that, somebody said, well, what about tithing? You know, that's just a part of the law. No, tithing goes back to Abraham. Abraham, Melchizedek, that whole thing. So the tithing isn't a part of the law, so that's not really a part of the question, which is why it's in parentheses. Okay, good. So today's question. Now, we all know in the last several weeks that we have needed the stuff that the Bible has to say about relationships. Now, what you don't realize is I am totally delighted each week to see what verses I have to use to talk about the topics we're talking about. There is no, uh, God did not sit down and say, I think I'll organize the beginning of the Bible and the beginning of the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs to go with a series that Van will do someday on relationships. So you would think every week, I'm just like rolling the dice. There could be no verses on relationships this week and I would be so in trouble. And then I was, I was um, anyway, I was sick one week and threw off the rotation and, and John taught. And they still fit. How did we do that, right? Well, the bottom line is, God really wants us to be in relationship with him. And this whole thing is about us being in relationship with him. And part of what proves to him that we really want to be in relationship with him is the way we treat each other. So it's also about how we treat each other. So my guess is we really, 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 really need the stuff we're hearing. Today, we're talking about truth. Quick survey. How many people think truth is important to a relationship? Oh, gee, that was like, so we could just go home. We already know the point. Let me start with a verse that's not in our reading. It's from the Apostle Paul. The last thing he wrote was 2 Timothy. The older I get, the more I appreciate 2 Timothy. But it's, it's a lot of his uh, belief and passion distilled in very tight verses. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, Paul says, Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. So what's the first thing we learn? If somebody's opposing the truth, what are we supposed to do? Gently instruct them, okay? I think our whole world should read 2 Timothy 2.25. Our world is becoming more and more and more polarized. We are more and more and more uh, aggressive in our language toward each other. And it makes me sad that our nation on a political platform 
is so divided. But honestly, the church is not far behind. If you don't believe just like our church believes, we don't even want to have fellowship with you. And there's all this horrible, the way we treat each other, the way we speak to each other, it just needs to stop. Paul says, if, they're not, if you don't think what they believe is truth, then, then speak to them gently. Gently instruct them, those who oppose the truth. Okay, who here wants to oppose the truth? Nobody. I mean, who would on purpose oppose the truth? So that's where we're going this morning. We're going to look at five false narratives that are running around in our head that come from five different places. We oppose the truth because we're listening to something that's not truth and accepting that. Nobody is intentionally opposing the truth. We just got a lot of crazy going along inside of our head. That's a technical term for those who have never been like in the counseling field. Crazy is what we have going on between our ears. It's a technical word. Okay. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. I didn't know that was part of the deal. I just thought, well, you know, God's giving us truth, and sometimes we get in the way of that, and we have narratives running through our head. But the enemy of our soul loves to feed those false narratives. He loves to go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're justified. It is as bad as you think. What happens when you rehearse that stuff again and again and again and again in your head? It solidifies, it sticks, and unknowingly, you are opposing the truth. So hopefully I'm going to do this gently this morning and we'll all be in a better place by the time we're done. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you that in Jesus, there is hope for us. There is life for us. It's not about being perfect. It's not about living our life with no errors. We will make mistakes. We live in a broken world, but in the middle of all of that, you are still redeeming us. You are still drawing us to yourself. You are still helping us see the truth. You're helping us come to ourselves and embrace the truth. And by living in the truth, not only are our lives better now, but they are better for all eternity. We love you. We bless you. It's all because of Jesus. Amen. So if you've missed out this week on some of the emails going back and forth, my mom passed away last uh, Monday. And she'd been a part of Vista almost 20 years. So, you know... Uh, uh, bittersweet loss. She gets to be with Jesus. I would like to announce that today was her first day at church where she could both sing and dance. She's never been able to sing a tune in a bucket. There was one time she was standing next to me and she was singing and I'm going, way to go mom, you're singing harmony. And then we went a little further and it was a train wreck and I go, oh no, you were just that far off. Okay. It sounded like harmony there for just a second. My Mennonite brethren will appreciate singing harmony. Okay. But now she can sing. And now she can dance. Always frustrated her. My dad was a great dancer. My mom could, just didn't have it in her, right? And now she's dancing with Jesus. So the bottom line is, this is all about um, eternity. What we talk about today is all about where we end up and how we live our life now and, and what our reality will be for all eternity. But the bottom line is, um, as much as I do appreciate everybody's words of sympathy, um, my biggest loss was when we let her go live with my sister and just so that my sister could have some time with her before she was gone and did not think. We thought maybe by the end of the year, but there's no way we thought. It's been like six weeks. Uh, we didn't know it would happen this quickly, but uh, God knows, and my mom is very, very happy, and you can email her at... No, okay. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So I want everybody, in, by way of starting, take out your phones... And I want you to turn them on, and I want you to uh, flip the screen so you can take a selfie. And I want everybody to take a selfie with you, maybe the person sitting next to you, maybe the people sitting behind you. There's those guys, and kind of get those guys in there. Da, 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 da. Oh, I got to get these guys over here because they feel left out. Okay, am I seeing phones? Yeah, you better be doing your phones. I don't bring my phone. You don't bring it? Oh, here, you can do one of mine. No, seriously. Do one of mine. Get Dave Eddy in there with you, behind you. That'll be great. Scary, but great. Okay, we live in a culture where selfies are just a way of life. I looked it up online, and this is the definition of a selfie. 
The selfie phenomenon, which has transformed our social culture, hear what they're saying, has transformed our social culture, is commonly understood to be a photograph that has been taken of oneself and shared on social media. They're saying it transformed our culture. And I would agree at some level. It really has changed who we are. In the old days, they used to talk about people that were narcissistic. Now they just talk about Facebook. It's the same word, just, just <laughs> changed. And there's a selfie of Deb and I. This is our most recent one. We were recently looking to buy an X-Wing fighter, but <laughs> there, was, there was one you know, left over from the Blue Squadron. And, but will its wings fit in the garage? I don't think so. So we decided to pass. But anyway, that's us. And by the way, if you haven't been to Disney lately, you might want to go. That was a lot of fun. All right. Five different kind of false narratives that run through our heads. They, they come from different sources, but they're all just as potentially damaging. The first, many false narratives are selfie generated. Notice how I did that? Selfie generated? Self generated, yeah, yeah. But selfie generated, got it. In Judges, it talks about how, you know, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. And that was considered a bad thing. And it was all because they didn't have a king or they didn't have a central leader. They didn't have one authority in their life that kept them all moving in one direction. So everybody was doing whatever they wanted, which kind of sounds a lot like us. Right? And you say, well, you know, we have one authority. We, you know, we're America with... with seemingly to me, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but half the people seem to be leaning one way and half the people seem to be leaning the other way. And every couple of years, it, it flips back and forth because there's about a half and half split on that deal. And both sides really, 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 really don't like each other. So we get kind of jerked back and forth, you know, year after year till you just kind of get numb. And quite honestly, we don't have a central authority in our life. Now for us, is that supposed to be the government? Love my country, but is that supposed to be the government? <clears throat> it's God. We, we have a central authority. And with that, we should be walking in more unity than we are. And I'm talking to the church as much as I'm talking to our culture. In our church, we are just getting nasty with each other. If they don't agree with us, we're going to be nasty about them. So here's two narratives I want us to look at. And what's really fun, um, because I'm going to the funeral next weekend, I'm kind of working on two weeks of message prep. Um, I'm looking, I've already read through next week's readings, and I realize some of them really go well with this week's, so I'm going to go back and forth because I can. <laughs> All right. My Bible. Okay. <laughs> but from last week's reading in, in Mark 1, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Now, in next week's reading, there's a very similar passage, but it's different. So pay attention. See if you can catch it. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing. Be healed. Right? So, and they all lived happily ever after. It's a really good story, right? Okay. Mark 9.22, which we'll read this coming week. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Now, I love that story because that's, I feel like we all feel that way at times. Yes, we, we get it. Our, our faith is really important to how this all works. And there are times we really need help with our faith. But you see the difference in the stories. The first guy goes, you can do it. And again, it's his narrative in his head. I, I know enough about Jesus. I know he can do this, but will he want to do it? I don't know if he'll want to do it. But if you're willing, you can do this, right? And Jesus, in compassion, didn't correct his thinking. He just said, be healed, and he was. Yay! Second guy, narrative in his head is, I'm not really sure about this Jesus guy, but I'm desperate. I'll try anything. And I'm not sure he really can, but I can ask him if he will. And Jesus is going, if I can? The stuff running around in your head is going to keep you from receiving what I want to give you. And the guy goes, okay, I believe. Help my unbelief. And they lived happily ever after. Yay. Okay, so good stories, good stories. Let me shift gears a couple times here. What will relationships be like in heaven? When you get to heaven, what will relationships be like? 
Words. I'm looking for words. Long term. There's a long term relationship. <laughs> you are a funny man, Hal. You are a funny man. <laughs> Harmonious. Glorious. Glorious. Truthful. Truthful. Are you ready? Yeah, it's like we are now in Jesus, with Jesus forever. This is like the most wonderful thing that will ever happen, ever. Right? You know what they are? They're not self-focused. You will not get to heaven, pull out your phone, go, look, Jesus. <laughs> you will not be doing that. It won't be about you anymore. You won't even have a mirror, let alone a cell phone. You will not have beauty aids to make you look beautiful. Because though you will look more beautiful than you have ever looked, it will pale in comparison to the Savior. It will be perfect, which means it won't be about you. So let's wind that back, kind of, you know, reverse engineer. What makes it so wonderful? It's not about you. You want to make your life right now wonderful? It's not about you. It's hard for us to stop believing the lies that are bouncing around in our head. Has anybody ever tried and found it just difficult? It's like, no, I've got stuff in my head that's getting in the way. It's hard to believe, help my own belief. You know, you, you get that, right? Hint, if you want to stop something, stop making it about you. And watch half of your false narratives vanish. I will let that sink in. Stop thinking about yourself. Stop making it about you. The reason your brain is confused with a whole bunch of stuff that's not true is because probably half that stuff is because you still think it's all about you. Okay, shift gears again. Why did we come here today? Why are we in church? Why did we do this? I'll give you two choices. First, how many came here to be blessed? You didn't wait for the second choice. <laughs> How many came here to bless others? Oh, that's a better spiritual answer. Yeah, I got that one. Okay, so you got to wait till they both come out. That's how you play those TV games. You got to wait for the whole question. <laughs> Nobody comes to church hoping they won't be blessed. Okay, I get that. I get that. But how much do we come to church thinking about us? Church for us is a selfie. We're in the foreground, and everybody else is just the background to our experience of God. How much better? And again, if you want to stop doing something, stop making it about yourself and start living your life to be used by God, to be a blessing to others. God loves you. He has embraced you. He has put you in his son. And if he ever changes that, he'll get a hold of you and let you know. That's the way my dad said when he said he loved my mom when they got married. He said, if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. That should stand. No, that's my dad. I'm sorry. Get my dad out of my head. Okay, good. No, in the end, God loves you. That is not going to change. That is not going to go away. You don't have to try to keep trying to earn that or make it about you. Let it go. When we come to church, come to church to be a blessing to other people. Just a hint. Okay. Number two. You know, many narratives are self-generated. Many leave God out. And obviously, this is natural for a person that doesn't know God. I mean, that's just kind of obvious, right? But there's a lot of us as believers. And I'm going to use a verse here from David where David is losing sight of God in the midst of all of the stuff that he's, that he's um, living with. Mark 2.22. And no one puts new wine into an old wineskin. For the wine would burst the wineskin, and the wine and the wineskin would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskin. Jesus is teaching them, and we'll put quotes on this, but new truth. Truth that quite honestly completely comes out of the Old Testament, but it's like they're hearing this. For, they've never seen anybody put it together this way before. And Jesus is teaching them new truth. What happens when you get new truth in an old mindset? When, when you try to put the truth of Christ in your old way of doing your life, anybody here ever eaten a banana and then had a, like a sip of Sprite soda? Okay, when you get home, do this to your kids. Okay, just give them a, a, a bite of banana, just a chunk of banana, have them chew it up, swallow it, and then drink a soda. Does anybody know what happens? 
First service, they're, they're so much more worldly than you guys. They know this stuff. Okay, has anybody ever taken a soda bottle and put Mentos in it? Same thing. <laughs> so they have a party in their mouth because they just ate a minute. Was I the only one that was ever a youth pastor? Where'd Chris go? Chris should know this stuff. But when you take the teaching of Jesus and try to put it into your old lifestyle, everything will be lost. It will blow you up. So what he's saying is you need a new life to put this truth into. So as you're listening to the truth of Jesus, and you're going, I like this. Okay, now let's get ready for it. As you step in faith into God, when you receive the gift of Jesus, that truth now can flourish because it's in good soil. It's in a heart that's, that's ready for it. So Jesus says, your narrative matters. And bringing in a new narrative isn't going to work unless you deal with this. Philippians 3.9, Jesus says, well, Paul says, of Jesus, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that God, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So this is what Paul offers us in the New Testament, a righteousness that is not our own, a righteousness that is found in Christ, right? Now, when you take that and you have that, now all this teaching of truth fits, and otherwise it doesn't. Mark 8, 33. Jesus says to Peter, get away from me, Satan. You are seeing things merely, how? From a human point of view, not from God's. Peter is walking with Jesus, and he's trying to figure things out, leaving God out of the equation. Anybody find that a bit odd? Right? But if you don't, it's because you've done it. <laughs> We do that. We could be sitting right here in church trying to figure out the problem that is ours right now, not really hardly listening to what's going on because we've got this thing playing in our head and the whole time we're trying to figure it out ourselves and leave God out of the equation. For some of us, it's like, well, you know, doing it the way the Bible says, that's like so old-fashioned. Point of record. The one who inspired Scripture is the great I am. As he was in the days of the Old Testament, he is now as he is in our most distant future. He doesn't get surprised by new thinking because he's already been there. What we believe is not old-fashioned. It is eternal. Okay. Romans 2, 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and the customs, in our case, the false narratives of the world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, what is good and pleasing and perfect. Yes, God would like to inform the narrative that is in your head. And as you allow him to do that, you will find that it's good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. And again, perfect means Fully developed, fully formed. Okay, so false narratives, sometimes they're self-generated, sometimes they leave God out. And even for us, we can leave God out. And then many are hyper-spiritual. I have said for decades now, an observation I made back when I was a youth pastor, and that is that people lie. <laughs> All people lie. And you go, no, I don't. Yeah, stick with me. All people lie for their own reasons. You may not lie for the reason that somebody else fell into lying, but you will lie for your own reasons. I will lie to not embarrass somebody in the room. I am my mother's son. That was a woman who, until her later days, never embarrassed me. <laughs> we'll leave that story for another time. But the filter kind of went, you know, thin on that. Not embarrassing thing. Anyway, it, it is in me. I don't want to embarrass other people. I just don't. So I, somebody will say, you know, if I look big in this dress, no. I mean, you know, I just, I don't want to embarrass people. Right? And you say, well, that's not, that's just a little white lie. It's a lie. Well, what about hyper-spiritual people? Do they lie? Absolutely. Say it again. Why, why would a hyper-spiritual person not be honest, not tell the truth, believe a false narrative? 
Yeah, self-justification. They're trying to protect their narrative. We will be dishonest, even when we don't realize it, to protect whatever false narrative we have running through our head. Jesus had so much to play with with the Pharisees, but here we go. Uh, Mark 2, verse 27. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So he's trying to jerk the chain of these Pharisees who are being real. And quite honestly, you know what, they're, what they think? We keep the Sabbath. You're not doing it. I'm better than you are. That's really where they're going with this. They are protecting their narrative about themselves. And Jesus says, it's not the way it works. The, the Sabbath was not put in place so you could prove how spiritual you are. It wasn't put in place so we would have requirements to meet. And then he finishes with, and so the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. So what he's saying is, and let's just talk about this. As far as authority goes, because quite honestly, authority has everything to do with who you need to listen to. If you've got a boss at work, you need to listen to them even if they're completely wrong because they're your boss. We told our kids when they played sports and the referee made a bad call. Has anybody ever seen a referee make a bad call? <laughs> Preach it. And I would tell particularly my oldest daughter, some people have the right to be wrong. That referee is trying very hard to call this game the best they can possibly call it. But they will make mistakes. I'm not defending it, saying it was right or wrong. I'm just saying some people have the authority to make a wrong call. Now, with God, he doesn't make wrong calls. But Jesus said, but just to be clear on this little discussion we're having right now, I have all authority on this matter. I am Lord even of the Sabbath. And then uh, Mark 7, this coming week, we'll see this. One day, Jesus, one day, some of the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law arrived from Jer Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. Again, every time they had a chance, they wanted to prove we're more spiritual than you guys because we follow these rules and regulations. The bottom line is, whatever the narrative is in your head, is what's controlling your life. And their narrative was, we're better than everybody else. So at the point that Jesus is confronting them, they're not being honest with themselves or him, which is why he said, you guys look really good on the outside, but I see the inside, and it stinketh muchly. King James. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> if, by chance, you're hyper-spiritual, and you're looking down on other people that they have these other false narratives running through their heads, own your own. Honestly, when I listen to Christians fussing with each other, the thing that just seems so obvious is like, okay, when you, if you would just take the criticisms you have of each other and like use it as a mirror and see yourself, we wouldn't have to have this conversation. Number four, many false narratives are sin-based, or you could say fear-based, and I think this all just kind of goes together, because in sin, there is, there is great fear. Psalm 40, David says, For troubles surround me, too many to count. When, when um, our one daughter was teasing our other daughter uh, years ago when they were kids, young, um, the one daughter, was, the older daughter, was just so upset. And I took my hand, I just put it in front of her face, and I said, how big is my hand? And she said, well, it looks really big. You are so bright. I took it back. I said, how big is my hand? Doesn't look as big. I took it further back. Looks smaller. When, when we let our sin be the thing we are focusing on, when we let our brokenness, when we let whatever, our fears, the thing that we're, that we're looking at right here, it, it overwhelms us, which is a bit... I love David because the Psalms are not just filled with all the wonderful things you should do. It's filled with a lot of the stuff David was feeling in the moment, and he's just very honest about what he's feeling. My sins have piled up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. I, I totally think that's the way he's feeling. I don't know that it's true. I think it's just the way he's feeling. He's letting his fear, he's letting his sin, he's letting his feelings color his narrative. But for many of the Psalms, by the time David gets to the end of the Psalm, he figures it out, and it fits well in a 30-minute slot for TV. It's just happy ending before we're done. Second Chronicles 16, the eyes of the Lord, this is what's true. 
Search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. It does not say, and God is searching the whole earth to see where are the people that have their act together, and I want to be really nice to them, and I want to call them to myself because they've got this all figured out. It's not what it says. As David is feeling overwhelmed, and if today you're here and you're feeling overwhelmed by the realities of your life, realize that God is looking for you to have your heart fully committed to him. And it doesn't matter the mess, he still wants to be, he wants to what? He wants to come alongside you and strengthen you. So if you need his strength, you don't have to get your act together. You just have a, take your heart and fully, you know, put it in his direction. And finally, many false narratives are naively embraced. And honestly, when I started, I thought this would be where I'd start, but it turns out it's where I'm ending. There's so much in our world today that, um, well, I've talked to people. And, and, and again, some people are just more discerning than others. Okay, let's all be fair. We're not, we don't all have the same level of giftedness as far as discernment goes. But, and you may feel like the person I'm getting ready to describe here. So, but it's like, okay, I heard this argument from these people over here, and it makes a lot of sense. And then I heard the argument that these people gave, and that makes a lot of sense. And I heard this argument, and that makes a lot of sense. And I hear this argument, and that makes a lot of sense. And you realize, but none of them agree with each other. So I must be missing something here. There is a naivety in our culture that we just kind of believe the best and want to embrace everything we hear from everyone. And we need to be discerning. We need to take what we hear in life and put it against what God would say. And in that, we, we now know, okay, this is true, this is not true, because this, this is in opposition to what God would tell me. Mark eight fifteen. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch out, beware of the yeast of the, of the Pharisees and of Herod. There was a political correctness of that day. There was a social acceptability of that day. And who doesn't want to get along with the rest of culture? Who doesn't want that? But Jesus said, be careful. If you try to please Herod, if you try to please the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you, if you try to please, please the, the kind of the political environment of what's going on here, you're going to end up at odds with God because there's a lot of what they're doing that's just flat out of bounds. And it's like yeast. So what does that mean? It's like yeast. It grows, starts out very small, and then, in, okay, anybody ever made pancakes? We just had French students here last week. That was really fun. And so for like about the second breakfast here, Deb's going, you guys want to have pancakes? Oh, pancakes, ooh la la, you know? So it's like, great, you know? And it's like, okay, let's make pancakes. So she let them make them. You ever had a pancake without any rise to it? It's like a rubber Frisbee, and you put a little maple syrup on it and fight it down. But what does yeast do? It, it spreads, and it gets into all whatever you, pancake. It gets throughout the pancake, and the whole pancake rises, right? It's not like you get a flat spot and a risen part. No, it, it all just mixes together, and, and the pancake works. They thought they were great. <laughs> it's just like, that's the way we all make them in America. Yeah, just, just like that. Okay. Galatians 5, Paul kind of explains this further. He says, you were running the race well. Who has held you back from following the truth? This is so much what we're talking about today. It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. So this is a metaphor for Jesus. This is a metaphor for Paul. It's a good metaphor. There is a false narrative at every turn. And if we're naive about it, we can take that on to ourselves, and then it'll spread through everything else we believe, and it'll ruin it. Mark 2, verse 16. But when the teachers of the religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? The Pharisees, to feel good about themselves, had to demonize everybody else. And that attitude can be infectious. Years later, Peter is confronted by Paul. Why? Because he won't eat with Gentiles. And Paul's going, eh. 
It's Peter. It's superhero Peter. That, that yeast got into his thinking and it held him back. So I would love to say, accept Jesus and all this bad stuff goes away. It's just not the way it works. You have to be paying attention to what's rattling around in your head. And if you're thinking something that doesn't, if the equation doesn't come right, out right in the end, what does it mean? You have to back up and figure out what was in my equation. What is the thing that's throwing off the end result of my equation? And the Pharisees, their poison was thinking they were better than everybody else. Colossians 2.8. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of the world rather than from Christ. I mean, this, that it, he just summed up our lives. We need to pay attention to what's in our head. We need to pay attention to where we're not being honest with ourselves, where we're not being honest with God. And if we would do that, we would actually flourish. Close with Mark chapter 4, verse 24. Jesus speaking. Pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given, and you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who do not listen, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Now, for some, they hear that and they go, that's not very nice. And it's probably not fair. But it is Jesus. It's not the only place he says stuff like that. He wants to give us more and more and more. But at the point that we stiff arm what he wants to give us, he says, okay. And he doesn't force it on us. But then what we do have will also evaporate. For us to live by the truth, it will set us free. The hard part is we often don't live by the truth because we're blinded by our false narratives. God wants us to see through that and flourish in Jesus. Let's all stand for prayer. Lord God, for each of us today, we have something that we need to learn, some way we need to apply this, a place where we need to grow. Let us begin by, in repentance, asking you to forgive us for tolerating some of the nonsense that rattles around in our heads. Anything that separates us from you is a bad idea. Lord God, every single one of us needs to find ourselves in you. Why are we here today? Because we want to be found in Christ. We want to grow up and mature in Christ. And we want to have that influence, that same zeal for not us, but for all of those who are around us. Lord God, we need you, every single one of us. May we be found in you today.